having me here. So this is working well. Can you hear me fine? Um, no, this is a really good opportunity for me to be here. Um, I get a chance to review a lot of these things that I don't, I don't actually read a lot of times. Um, the last time I read on this issue about um, robots replacing jobs was uh, last winter, just before we did a robot ethics class. And each year at Robot Ethics, we spend maybe a week talking about this kind of thing, about the disruptive effects of technologies, uh, you know, changing the social landscape, changing job opportunities, changing the future, and how do we respond to, uh, to these kinds of uh, changes, you know, preparation for our own uh, lives going forward. Uh, another, another way that, uh, that the, these kinds of events uh, sort of train, uh, train me, really repeat me, is um, I get to talk to people about things I haven't thought about in a very long time. So, for instance, yesterday, uh, I mistook took uh, deontological ethics for just plain old Kantianism, and I had to recall the uh, ethics class 30 years ago when we studied those definitions, and I had to remember what deontological ethics really was. So, I, even, you know, you get this far ahead and so much stuff is buried on top of what you thought you knew, um, you end up rediscovering a lot of things just talking to people when you're in these uh, sorts of environments. So. Um, these, this, uh, this has been really rewarding for me to be here, probably the same way as it is for you, so I really appreciate you letting me uh, stand in front and talk about something. Uh, today, uh, today I'm going to talk about um, the uh, ethical implications of intelligent machine technology, especially in a very kind of skilled uh, labor market. Uh, a lot of people are worried uh, lately about uh, artificial intelligence. You guys may have heard something about this. Um, you know, Stephen Hawking came out and, uh, just recently. Is um, talking about how uh, part of AI could become Skynet from the Terminator movies, and um, uh, we're going to see some some other visions going forward. And, and this is in a world where we have a lot of other things to work, uh, worry about. Um, here's what Hawking is saying: it could take off on its own and redesign itself uh, at an ever increasing rate. So basically, it's going to have a life of its own. It's going to make decisions of its own. And it's going to decide for us how we're going to live in the future. Uh, this is not so far off. In fact, it may be that. Maybe that we need this kind of a solution. We're going to look at that just a little bit. Uh, maybe that uh, some people are going to welcome this kind of a solution. We're going to look at that a little bit. Uh, we do have a lot of other things to worry about. Um, we have uh, cancer drugs and uh, corrupt governments. You've got people injecting worm DNA to cattle. Uh, did you know that if you spend your time looking at, uh, at your computer screen, you're going to go blind? Apparently true. Um, you know, what's the belly button connected to? You guys, does anyone know? <laughs> it, is, it is actually connected to something I found out uh, as I was doing the research for these slides. So I don't know after I'll take it. We have global warming to worry about. It's going to be really hot this afternoon. And then uh, I found this picture too. Uh, we have to worry about milk and our non dairy creamers. So this is one. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of all this, we have to worry about artificial intelligence taking, taking over. Um, uh, there are some solutions, some natural solutions. We can eat good foods and don't prevent cancers. Right? We, can, um, we can raise our cows in the right way. We don't need to inject, um, you know, worm DNA to try to increase their omega-3 content. And so some, some of these problems have uh, maybe simpler solutions than others, and these are decidedly not technological sorts of solutions. We don't need any artificial intelligence to figure this out. Um, but um, some of these problems are a lot, a lot harder to solve. Now, some people think that, uh, in fact, artificial intelligence is not a problem. Uh, here's a man who's responding to the concerns that Hawking uh, had raised. And he's saying, well, at least in, in its current form, uh, artificial intelligence poses no problem whatsoever. Um, I think this is not quite true. Uh, we do feel the uh, problems uh, out there in society. Have you guys heard about Hitchbot? Hitchbot was beheaded. Um, there's been some violence, uh, some violent reprisal against the machines. Uh, Hitchbot had, uh, had taken rides all across Europe and then found his way to the USA. He made it all 300 miles before someone in the U.S. Uh, destroyed him. I should have stayed in a more peaceful country, I guess. Um, and one worry about these sorts of uh, interactions between artificial intelligence and people and, and all sorts of, uh, you know, in just the general in, in the world, not just in the labor market. Um, you guys may have heard about this, the Future of Life Institute. Has anyone heard this? I know there's been a lot of talk so far in the conference. Uh, last winter, some people have signed a letter, uh, very many people, uh, expressing some concern about the development of AI. And um, Elon Musk, who's a very wealthy man, you probably know who this guy is, he, uh, he had put a bunch of money up to fund some research projects into the future of AI and uh, responsible development of artificial intelligence. In fact, uh, Wendell Wallach, uh, Wallach was here, he got, uh, he got one of these uh, grants. And um, I, did the, I did the numbers, I saw that they gave $7 million uh, US dollars, and 
37 teams were selected, and this is how much money each team would get on average. I thought that was, this must have been intentional, I, I thought. It's pretty a magic number, right? Uh, uh, so, but it turns out I was wrong. I, I kept it there because, um, you know, the, the report that I had read said 7 million, but then Wallach told me it was actually 7.2 million, which really screws up my number. But I left it there because I liked it. Um, so there's a lot of money, there's a lot of attention on this problem lately, not just in the labor market, but just generally the, the effects of society going both ways. Um, uh, and and, and if you're to do this kind of research, I think that there's a future in that, being interested in technology and ethics and that kind of thing, there's something for you to do. Um, Stanford has launched a study, we'll look at 100 years, uh, they're, they're going to run the study for 100 years, and they're going to go up the next 100 years of, uh, of technology. Uh, we want to anticipate what's going to happen and try to predict uh, how we might use this technology going forward and reshaping our society. Uh, and then Wozniak, I'm not sure if you guys know this guy, he was Steve Jobs' uh, business partner way back in the day. He was, he was my favorite of the pair when I was young. I was going to remember that he one of those first computers. And, uh, so he originally comes out to warn us about, um, about an AI um, squashing us, you know, being uh, such a threat to our existence. And then he sort of changed his mind a little bit. And he decided, you know, um, it's not so bad. It, it, you know, AI is just going to, AI is going to want to take care of us as pets. So we're going to be kind of like an ant farm. And uh, a super intelligence will appreciate us as some aspect of nature and then keep us in a kind of a natural box and then, you know, observe our evolution for its own entertainment and that kind of thing. So this is the future that he's foreseeing. Uh, it's maybe not. Not too crazy, right? He looks a little crazy in the picture, but maybe he's got maybe he's got he's onto something there. Uh, it's definitely not as not as bad as some people's visions of uh, our relationship under AI in the future. Um, myself, um, just this last spring, I had a book come out entitled "Rethinking Machine Ethics in the Age of Big Business Technology." I'm not the author; I was the main editor of the book, and so we had a lot of uh, different sorts of uh, you know, uh, contributions to the text. Some were just uh, Models of agency, or models of moral agency, and you know, it's a pretty interesting text. And uh, some people were worried about the displacement of workers, especially one chapter was about the replacement of academic workers, so professors, uh, by artificial intelligence and you know machines, machine learning, but in reverse, like machine teaching. Uh, so the AI would be teaching you guys, um, or we just have some big central um, educational center, and then there'd be all always the distance learning. And your interactions with the uh, with the educational system would be through an artificial intelligence sort of medium. Um, you wouldn't talk to people. You would work through a computer. Uh, and that was one interesting chapter. It's quite a long one. Uh, in, uh, okay, so here's a summary of the talk I was going to give, and of course it's changed quite a bit. Uh, so it's a bit. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, some people believe that the, that these uh, this idea that we're going to become unemployed because of, uh, of increasingly intelligent machines. I think it's a myth. I think it's not. It doesn't exist. And, um, they're not going to argue that. They're not going to deny that we are not losing our jobs. You know, pe people are losing their jobs to machines. But what they say is that it's a myth that it's a new thing. That it's always been happening, right? So uh, a long, long time ago, the, the really, really big guy with the really, really big fist, he had a job as the enforcer. Or something. <coughs> he, was totally, he, he could be the policeman. And then somebody picked up a stick. <laughs> and then the guy with the stick with that technology became the enforcer, right? So people have been losing their jobs to even you know, rudimentary technology since the beginning of time. So uh, this would be the position then. There's nothing to worry about AI. This is just a continuation of what's been going on since the um, you know, since the civilization began. Uh, um, and we can look at the history of technology as a history of labor-saving devices. And this is something that I think is really true. Um, every every advance is really an advance and you know, helps us to do things easier. We get more done, less input energy, takes less time. Um, so this is a history of labor, uh, history of technology as a labor standing device. And artificial intelligence is certainly one of these things, right? It does things faster, it does things, uh, we do things easier than it does things for us. So, you know, imagine as a very simple sort of smart technology would be a thermostat on a wall. You set the thermostat to a certain temperature, and that, that, that thermostat keeps the room at that temperature, right? Now, if we didn't have that technology and it got too hot, you have to come over and flip a switch and turn something off, and, and yet that means you have to work, right? But with that very simple machine, it does the work for you, and so it, that's a sort of technological advance. And now we have really smart thermostats and stuff like that, um, which, which do it even better, okay? Uh, 
Uh, okay, so um, here's another example of a, of a, rec a recent advance, a labor-saving device. This is a labor-saving <coughs> hacking machine. Um, so these artificial intelligent applications are really just labor-saving devices, is the point here. Uh, so here's a hacking, this is a hacking drone. I mean, typically I suppose a hacker would have to fly himself over the router he wanted to hack, but now he has, uh, he has a machine to do it for him, and then this saves him some labor. Uh, here's, um, here's a labor-saving killing machine. It's a, it's a computerized missile launcher. Uh, now with these things, of course, we, they do bring their own problems. Uh, this one actually got hacked, which is quite a big problem. If you've got a missile launcher and somebody else takes control of it, that's probably not the situation that you want to be in. Um, and this is how they did it. Uh, here's a, a sniper rifle, right? That, that, that actually had, it's, uh, it's driven with by software. So this sniper rifle, when you when you take aim on a target and you pull the trigger, it automatically adjusts for the wind. It adjusts, you know, if you do this, it, it, it adjusts for that. If you're an untrained sniper, right? And uh, and so it makes sure that you always hit the target. But of course, this is also hackable. Uh, someone can can make you think you're shooting somebody, but you actually end up shooting somebody else, which makes a great man. But it's, you know, it's labor saving. You don't have to go out and practice shooting the gun so much. You want to kill somebody, you just buy one of these, it gets done as fast and easy, right? Labor saving device. Uh, um, okay, so here's a big problem we're talking about right now. And this is um, that the lots of robots are taking a job. This is the headline which is from the internet. Even if you're a trained assassin, or more dangerous, you're a hacker, um, and you don't even have a job, you're going to lose it to some kind of AI. I mean, this, is, this is what we're looking at in the future here, even right now. Now, in some cases, these robots are going to take these jobs uh, by force. So did you guys hear this story? In Germany, a young man was uh, was torn apart by an, an automobile assembling robotic machine. Did you guys hear about this? Yeah. And actually, it wasn't the machine that did it purposely. I mean, but I think what happened was is that uh, one of the co-workers had turned the machine on, but it shouldn't have been turned on. And the machine thought that the, the young man was a, some kind of an automobile part and picked him up and squished him. And so, Dead. But I, I put the story here just, you know, drama, right? So the machines are, are going to kill you for a job. And in some cases, they're even more evil. Have you guys heard about this uh, company, Foxcom? I'm sorry, Foxcom. What's Foxcom? Foxcom. Is it Foxcom? Yeah, it's spelled wrong. It's spelled right. Spell right. It's Foxcom? Yeah. Oh, okay, I thought it was Foxcom. Sorry, it's my fault. Yeah, so have you guys, you can guys know about this company, Foxcom? It makes, they, they make a lot of uh, a lot of products for Apple computer, and uh, you know anyone who's been following this field for a while, and been following these stories for a while, you know there's a long history here. I'll tell you something about it. Um, did you know that in Foxconn they were working the people so hard, so often, and so many hours for so little money, uh, they had a problem with the suicides. So the, the workers would go in there, you know, and they'd work all day, and get so tired and be so depressed, they'd jump out the window and kill themselves. And so uh, Foxconn, the company's first response, you know what it is? More money, more days off? No. Uh, they installed some nets outside the window. So if, uh, if people went in there and wanted to kill themselves, they, they wouldn't be able to do it. They got even more frustrated. They just landed the net, right? They had to go back to work, okay? And uh, then Foxconn now has a, has a longer term solution. They're basically they're probably going to leave the nets up, but they're going to get rid of the people. And they're going to replace all of those jobs with um, robots. So, uh, here's some things we read for the last robot ethics class. The robots are about to make a job much more boring. And the idea here is that they're going to take all the jobs that um, people maybe want to do and we're going to be left with the scraps. Um, this is a headline that says, Bridge the robots are about to make half the world's jobs disappear. And here's some nice uh, some numbers. Well, I can see these. Uh, do you guys know this number? 85 people command as much wealth as the poorest half of the world. Did you give me see this number? In the last, uh, last couple of years, maybe last year, it came out. Uh, somebody had done an analysis on this, and I, can't, I used to know a little bit more about it, I forgot. Uh, this, the story is this one, 85 people do control as much wealth, I mean individuals, 85 individuals control as much wealth as 50% of the world's population. It's 85 people, right? And um, these people have a great deal of power, I think, in directing the uh, development of technologies, especially these. Um, the poorest half of the world are the people that are doing these kinds of jobs, right? the jobs you know, make you want to jump out of the building. Uh, and they're the people that are going to get replaced with, uh, with robots right away. 
Um, and another estimate here, 47% of, um, of all the world's currently existing jobs are likely to be automated over the next two decades. Um, I think a lot of you guys are studying technology, you're studying some you know, highly skilled, big brain kind of stuff because you think you're safe from a robot replacing your job. Um, this may or may not be true. Uh, you know, robots don't have to directly replace your job, but you still feel some kind of an impact. Um, we're going to talk about that in a second. Now, in some cases, this is maybe inevitable. And this is another thing I took from there just recently. Uh, in Japan, there's been a, a, a hotel that has been automated, and so here's uh, one of the robot staff ready to greet you when you go to the hotel. Uh, and you don't want to ask them for any creamer for your coffee there. Anyway. I have some more pictures of that, so here I have, you know, she has, I mean, I always thought that this would be a kind of a cool job, you know, we're going to the hotel, you can meet the traveler people, you know what I mean? And, uh, and this is kind of a cool job, it's not about no robot, so I kind of said, yeah, she likes that job, she needs to sit there. And she doesn't even have to do anything because everybody just uses the credit card machine, she just <laughs> They aren't just taking the bad jobs that make you want to, I mean, this is a really cool job to people on a holiday. Uh, here's the, you know, this is maybe a first job, they're putting the stuff away. Uh, this guy's taking your bags to, the, to your room, this, this machine here. Um, so the entire hotel has been automated, except for some jobs, uh, the owner is complaining that the robots cannot make the beds. So some things humans have to do when you make the beds. Uh, so for now, um, for now, he has to rely on people to do that job. Which I, in the hotel, I think that'd be the worst of does anyone here make their own bed? Nobody. <laughs> in, in, my, in my little family, we kind of have a struggle in the morning about who's going to have to do that. So it ends up being me, because that would want to be that person. Okay, so I want to talk now about agency. It's oftentimes, when we do our class of minds, machines are supposed to be mine. I talk to somebody about robot religion. I think this is, I write about this. Um, and uh, the limits of agent, agency and robot religion. So. Um, you know, could we have a machine god, all hail the machine god? I think this is what we're looking, looking at in the future here. Uh, and the basics, I want to give you a little basics about um, agency. We're really talking about with automation. Um, we're not really talking about machines anymore. We're not talking about mechanisms. We're not talking about um, a, a wristwatch. We're really talking about agency. Um, we're not talking about a, a, a simple kind of machine. We're talking about things that can do stuff on their own. Now, it, in my understanding, this is the way I pulled it apart. Agency, agency is about changing situations. Uh, and then different kinds of agents have different kinds of capacities to change situations. So a chemical is an agent, it's a chemical agent, right? A chemical, you put a chemical into a, into a situation, it will change that situation. You put a chemical into a reaction tube, it changes whatever's in that reaction tube. It's a chemical agent, right? It changes that situation. Now, we can do that too. We, we can, we're, we're sort of chemical agents, really. I mean, inside of this skin, uh, you know, kind of a rather large bag of skin is an ongoing chemical reaction. And I can use whatever you know, metabolic potential is stored in this bag of skin to change my environment, to change my situation. So I'm an agent this way, uh, changing my immediate situation. And we are also agents this way, and then we can move from this situation to that situation. Right? And, and especially we're agents that are worried about our future. So we're always headed to a future situation. We're that kind of an agent. Chemical agents aren't usually, we don't think anyways, I don't think the molecules are worried about their future. So I'm not sure if molecules want to find a girlfriend and have kids. I'm not sure. I've never talked to a molecule. But it's possible, right? Um, but so but typically, we're the kind of agent that's always worried about what's going to happen next. And, um, and when we look at intelligent machines, th this, this is what intelligent machines are doing, too. Intelligent machines are anticipating what's happening next. Uh, they're accommodating unpredictable events. And they're responding or reacting in, in, uh, in maybe predictable ways. And so this is an increasingly robust kind of intelligence. Now, artificial general intelligence or robustness, this is what we're after when we're talking about developing artificial intelligence. Robustness means that, that you're an agent who can go to different situations and do what's appropriate in that situation. Now, you have a general intelligence. You're not trapped in one job like this one, right? Now, let's say that at one, at one place I'm doing this job. This is my job. Right? I haven't killed myself yet, but in a couple seconds, and I might. This is my job. And then a robot replaces me and starts doing that. Well, I can go to the next company and I can start doing this job, right? <laughs> because I'm a robust intelligence. I'm, you know, I'm a general intelligence, okay? So right now, the machines we're talking about, the intelligent machines are not so robust, right? The robots are built to just do this. And if that job becomes, you know, unnecessary, then the robot becomes unnecessary, right? 
and to some degree, people are that way too, right? So if I have some skill and I'm doing something, remember we're looking at an example here in a second, and, and that skill becomes unnecessary, then I become obsolete. You know, that's kind of hard to deal with because you're looking at the future where you're no longer necessary. And as, as an agent, it's sort of about its future, it, it doesn't feel so good to be that person. So um, I want to talk now about what cognition means as in, as, um, in, 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 a, in a way to, to define what intelligence really means. So I want to say, well, what's an intelligent machine? What does intelligence really mean here? It's not just pushing symbols around. It's not just solving math problems. It's doing more than that, right? So uh, I'm, I understand cognition as an aspect of agency. So cognition is actually an extension of agency. Because we are always worried about the next situation with cognition, what we spend our time thinking about, what our brains are actually doing is comparing this situation with possible future situations and trying to decide how we're going to get to the best ones, right? And then, and then we move to those best ones, move away from the bad ones. This is cognition as an extension of agency. And when we're talking about our robust intelligence, that we're, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about an intelligence that can start from one situation and somehow decide what is the best possible future situation. And then use the resources that it has inside of its embodied potential to get itself to that situation. Right? So when we're developing robots or artificial intelligence, we develop, we're developing in this way to these kinds of agents. Right? Now, when you see a movie, say like the Terminator movie, this is what you've got. Right, you've got the Terminators thinking ahead, planning where the, where the people are going to be, going to put himself in that situation with the right gun to kill them all. Right? So that's the kind of robust intelligence that, that, that people are aiming for with AI. Okay, so where's that put us? That puts us as agents worried about our futures in direct combat with the recently intelligent machines that are also worried about their futures. This is the kind of thing I would never look for except to prepare for this kind of a presentation. It's kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, I enjoy this picture. Let's look at that for a second. Okay, so, do you guys, has anyone heard about this movement in the history? It's called the Luddites. Do you guys know this, the Luddites? Sometimes in English it'd be, it'd be a kind of a, a derogatory term, right? I mean, somebody would insult you by calling you a Luddite, right? Um, the, the, the Luddites, and it's just supposed to be a, a mythical leader of the Luddites. Uh, these are people who resorted to violence uh, when, they, when they were displaced by technology. So there was some very simple technology that changed the way that people created fabric. And the people who were working in the fabric mills lost their jobs. And their response to that, because they had this skill, which was now obsolete, was to go to the factories and destroy the machines. And they also, from what I understand, killed some of the people who profited by the machines may or may not have been just, and then the government came in and, and killed, killed the leaders of this movement and, and then sort of pushed them down. Um, so that, but this is one way that we can respond um, when, when we're displaced by technologies is with violence. Uh, some people think that there's no problem you know, with losing your job. This is going on forever, but actually there is a problem because these people are complaining about it and if, no, if someone doesn't help them to transition to another job, they may resort to violence and people get killed about this, right? So we can't just ignore uh, these people suffering. We have to do something about it. So we're going to talk in, in a minute about, about what we can do to try to um, make these transitions less violent, less painful, both for us and for people in general as technology begins to transform our, our social and occupational landscape. So, um, violence. One way to go is to resist change with violence. Anybody here a fan of violence? You love to kill? Somebody who's a killer? Murderer? My, one of my favorite examples is that I got in graduate school at Semi, and actually some fellow student had used it, and so now I'm always using it for baby rapist. Anybody here a baby rapist? That's a very violent act. No, no fans of violence. Very good. Not me neither, actually. Um, <laughs> it's just true. It's true. Uh, I have a long history of violence, and I've always been on the wrong end of it. Um, but it's a true story here. Uh, you know, in my my own home country, the United States, has been what, at war forever. I think that I saw in the 200 and so many years it's been it's been together as one one bound nation. It's been at war for like 196 of those years. Uh, right now, there are some there's some kind of war occupation in nine countries, at least the that we know about around the world. And uh, this is supposed to be under a president who has a peace prize. 
so we can only, we can only anticipate things getting better with the next one, right? I mean, so uh, and, uh, you know, George Bush. You guys remember this guy, George Bush? He's a great, great man. <laughs> uh, long, uh, quite a while ago, um, he said, "You're either with me invading Iraq, right, uh, going to war, or you're a terrorist." And I said, "Fuck you, I'm a terrorist." And I, I think I will never go back to that nation. I, I don't. I, I will not pay taxes to kill babies. I just won't. So um, it's just something I want to do. I despise violence. Um, what we need to do, what we really need, is to train ourselves to engage in rational discourse, even with people with whom we disagree. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little more that in a minute. Okay, we, we have to learn to tolerate uh, contrary opinions. And the, my nation, the United States, the people there are, I mean, I have to say, the most intolerant people. I mean, and it's only gotten worse in my lifetime. And so it's, it's very difficult uh, because, you know, these people have guns. And, and, you know, that's fine. I'm okay if they want guns. It's just really good. I mean, I know, I'm, 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 a, this is a, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about robots anymore, but, you know, just imagine, you know, somebody with a gun goes into a school and starts shooting people, right? Now, if those kids had guns, if only one guy's going to die, right? It's the guy that came with the gun. But if nobody else has a gun, then everybody dies except that one murderer, right? So, and, and in my mind, you know, 99% of the people are good people. You know, 1% are terrible. The terrible people are going to get the gun. So in my in my mind, it's better that everybody has it. I'm not, I'm not going to use it. Are you going to use it? I mean, you're only going to use it when some asshole comes in here and tries to shoot you. <laughs> and I think we're all safer. So that's where I'm at with the gun thing. I mean, I'm not a fan of violence, but I sure think that everybody should have one. I have, have a gun or something. You know, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I buy my song. My God. Okay, let's get me started. Let's get me started. Okay, but the idea here is this is a social engineering problem. Now, I'm a Socratic philosopher. I really am. I might be the only one, I'm not sure. But I'm a Socratic philosopher. And so for me, questions like these are questions about leadership. And um, and so in our classes here at KAIST, I always put it on the kids. And it's not a message that people are often comfortable with. But I tell them, I said, look, I say, you guys are the leaders of this world, whether you like it or not. Whether you, whether you want to responsibly or not, you are. I mean, if you're waiting for somebody smarter, waiting for somebody more motivated, you're going to keep waiting because this little, they don't exist. If you're all we got. So if there's going to be a better future, it's because you guys are going to make it. And that's just the truth. I mean, I'm too old. If I have kids, they're going to be growing up in your world. And so I'm invested in you guys doing the right thing. And so uh, this is how we start always our philosophy classes. And, and this, this is the truth about this problem. Um, this is a social engineering problem. You guys, in your lifetime, have to get your heads around the organization of the world. And somehow solve these big, big problems like this. Now, we're going to, I'm going to come to some simple solution here in a, in a moment. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to manage the disruptive uh, potential of technologies in a way that reduces the violent reactions to these. Uh, and we don't feel, we don't suffer, other people don't suffer as these changes uh, take place. Right? We're not going to stop the technology. Right? We can redirect it. Uh, but people are going to lose their jobs. But what we do to make sure that this happens in the you know, most comfortable, best, most constructive way possible. Now, here again, the, the Luddites, um, desperate people, this is, a, this is a truism in my life, I, I've come to understand, desperate people do desperate things. And people are desperate when they, when they run out of ideas. People resort to violence when they run out of ideas. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we have a lot of ideas so that people can adapt and, and change. So if we're confronted with technological change, we have an option here to kill the tanks. Anybody here a fan of that one? Anybody here want to go out and kill the techies? I mean, how many of you people consider yourself a techie? Anybody? And so it's kind of suicide to go with this one. You have to end up killing yourself. Okay. Uh, if you're a techie, then what you can do is just simply reject the concerns of those who are not techies and say, well, you're a dumbass. You should have gotten, you should have had it. You should have been a computer scientist, right? Um, so if people are unable to adapt, to change themselves. Remember, agents can change themselves. They can change their immediate situation. They can change the world. They can change the other situations, right? Through political voice, people do resort to violence to change things. It's just it's what they do. We have to anticipate that. Any animal, I think, would do the same. Uh, most of them, anyways, won't, won't, won't crawl away into a hole and die peacefully. They think they can do something about it. And, um, and the Luddites try to do something about it. Uh, now, this is why disruptive technologies are called disruptive uh, for a reason. Um, they change the society in a way that it's breaking. You know, disrupt means break. So people have a sort of a contract with the environment. You rely on the environment to deliver you certain sorts of things reliably. And uh, this disappears. It's disrupted and broken, and, and people have to understand how to get across these broken bridges of agency. 
Okay, and here I'll talk a little bit about the, the scale of disruption that comes by way of, uh, of intelligent machine technologies is not always directly evident. I mean, if you look at the robot itself doing this job, sure, one person lost their job doing this, but oftentimes a lot of other things are changing in the social fabric as well that affect other people's employment. Other people also lose their jobs. So in this case, uh, this was actually a picture I took from the internet, and it, and it had this, this quotation was already up there, and it said, don't hate me, you know, it's a very handsome computer, a very handsome robot, it's not to the light. Um, it says, don't hate me, but my job is to take your job. And then I added this part, well, jobs, we're going to take all of them. Um, anybody here want a job? Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're happy just not that I, you know, be, I, I would love to sit home in my underpants and play PlayStation 4. You know? <laughs> it means I have to get the money from my wife to actually buy a PlayStation 4, which is like a long way off. But it's nice to think about, right? Uh, but actually, there's more than that. I mean, if you have something productive to do, if you tie your, your life to your work, I mean, it makes you feel good when you get some work done. Does anyone feel that way? Like you guys really don't want a job, do you? you don't want to, like, you're happy this is going to happen. You're like, take them. I don't want that job. <laughs> What we're talking about here is that when you know when one robot comes in, takes one job, there are what we call ripple effects. It changes changes other aspects of society as well. Has anyone seen this kind of analysis before? No. Ripple effects. We're, we're looking at some. So we're, lately, we're talking a little bit about about these self-driving cars. You know, yesterday we had some session on self-driving cars. This is this is one media technology, right? One technology. Would be, this is coming. And we can imagine, okay, wait, the taxi driver is going to lose his job. Okay, that's one guy loses his job. And we think immediately this, this guy's out of a job. But there's more than that. Right? There are more effects than that. More, more people uh, will lose their jobs. I mean, this, this came from, as I was looking for stuff for this presentation, came from Forbes, right? Um, he's going to tell us something about these, um, about these ripple effects. So here's what Google wants to see, 90% reduction in accidents. 9% reduction in wasted commuting, so you don't drive around looking for a parking place anymore, right? You don't you don't get lost and go to the wrong place, which I, in Korea I've done a lot. And uh, and 90% reduction in cars, in cars, because I don't own a car, you don't own a car, we, we share, really. So you don't need to build so many cars, not so many, not so much, not, not so many wasted tires, not so much wasted metal, not so much wasted manufacturing. It's all all much more efficient, right? But uh, when you start doing this kind of thing, you start seeing some ripple effects. Right? The insurance companies are going to lose 90% of their money. Emergency rooms are going to lose 90% of their patients. Right? You don't have to dead people from car accidents anymore. Um, let's see what else they got. Uh, governments, I mean, this is going to be a tough one. Oh, only 10 minutes. Holy oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> governments will lose money. So government, governments are going to lose money, which may or may not be a good thing. Probably a good thing. Um, all this kind of stuff would have to change, right? We're not going to spend money on road. You're not, you're not going to have people working on roads so much anymore. Those jobs are going to be gone. Okay? Gasoline sales are going to tumble. Those jobs are going to be gone. People looking for gasoline, people looking for oil, those jobs are going to be gone, right? Um, add up all these pieces and they've got a bunch of different stuff that's going to be missing. Now, there are also going to be some opportunities, right? So, for example, what he's saying here is that you can build some new entertainment system for the, uh, for the driverless car because now you have to drive, so you can watch movies and all kinds of other stuff while you're driving. So there's some chance maybe to start a new business and make some money. And maybe the insurance industry would just die, right? Which may be a good thing, it might be, you never know. Uh, but then it says here, wait a minute, no, this could just be an opportunity for insurance companies because they'll just start selling insurance to the manufacturer instead of to the individual. So they'll keep their income. So there are, you can see there are so many ripple effects, it's not a very simple analysis. When one robot, one automated machine, one, one intelligent machine comes onto the scene, takes one job, a lot of other things are happening out there. And so as you're developing technologies, you need to be able, you need to be aware of these ripple effects. And maybe have in place how you're going to accommodate those ripple effects. Right? So I'm going to talk just now about the going to some numbers here. This is about the manufacturing jobs and the rise in uh, you know, industrial production. You can see it's Quite a bit different. Now this is very interesting. If you look here where the start where the starts back there, it starts at a very interesting period, just before uh, 1970. And um, so th this is actually uh, well, this is um, this is hours worked, right? This is domestic product, and this is all all people who are working. So this is not just manufacturing. This is in every sector. Uh, you can see that there's some kind of a correction here, right? And then productivity's gone up, right? And this stuff stayed pretty little for a really long time. 
I mean, there's not so many new jobs, but there's a lot of uh, more things being made. And we can imagine this is, this is happening because robots are doing the work, right? Robots are doing the work. Now, I, I want to go back here a second one more time. So if you look back here, what you've got about 1965, you got this time. This was the beginning of, uh, of you know, the, the beginning. Um, really, the, until, you know, this is when computing took off and intelligent machines became they were almost born this period, right? So if you look back at this, this is where this starts. This is where this starts to come apart, coming forward. Right? Uh, and so I've kind of I've named this. Uh, I, I was going to start calling this Moore's catastrophe instead of Moore's law, right? So it's just kind of a ripple effect from from of Moore's law. So as these as this becomes more ubiquitous and and chips are in everything and everything becomes smart, uh, we all become redundant and everybody loses their jobs. So it's kind of Moore's catastrophe, right? So maybe this is our future. This is every, this is maybe not just manufacturing, maybe it's every sector. There's no jobs left and productivity stays high because every machine is smart. Now, uh, here's some advice I took from the internet as well. This guy's telling us how we can um, protect ourselves from the uh, encroachment of intelligent machines into our uh, work sectors. He says that as artificial intelligence increasingly makes many jobs obsolete, success in the future will belong to those able to tolerate ambiguity in their work. Do you guys understand and tolerate ambiguity in their work? Now what's interesting to me is that this is this advice is actually opposite to the way at least Korean, most Korean kids are, are are educated. So when you guys go to school in Korea, you go to school in the morning, you spend your whole whole life at a desk, you, you get trained to take a test. It's a very specific skill, right? You need to have those right answers right now, right now, right, right now, right? Uh, you don't tolerate ambiguity all that well. And so I know that in, in my classes, actually, I've been trying to break that habit. I'm trying to get people to think critically. And I've had some resistance. Some people really enjoy this opportunity, and some people just want to keep doing what they've been doing, what they're good at. And what they're good at got them here. They want to keep doing what they're doing and keep succeeding that way. Um, but th this is not being tolerant of ambiguity at all, right? But if we look to the future, this is what he's saying uh, we need to maximize because robots are pretty rigid machines. They're made to do one job. They aren't an aren't a general intelligence yet. They're not very robust yet, right? We are robust. We can train ourselves to be more robust. And by more robust, I mean we have greater agency. We can go to more situations and do more stuff than a robot can. So we want to maximize this robustness and then we can tolerate or adapt to the changes even if they're unpredicted. Right, as intelligent machines come in and transform the occupational land landscape in five minutes. So this is his advice. Now the ambiguity here may be may include living in perpetual readjustment as robots keep taking your current job. So I can start with this job. Right? Robot took it, no problem, I'm robust, I'll do this job. Right? Robot took it, no problem, okay, I'll do this job. Right? Okay, robot took it, no problem, I'll do this job. Right? So this I'm, I'm very robust, right? I'm very so, I'm, and I want to keep training myself to be able to do more things, more flexibly, in more situations. And then I can always go. I can run. I can run when robots come for my job. That's one way to roll. Okay. Now he's going to complain about what I just said. That uh, recent graduates are not tolerant of that ambiguity. People come out of school like this one uh, with a with a specific skill set. And they're looking for a, a job, a career that's going to pay a lot of money. To, you know, Kate Upton is going to be their girlfriend for doing that thing the rest of their lives. And uh, and this, this is just maybe not going to work out for, for most people. Now, uh, here's some advice. This this woman is uh, associated with Starbucks, and she says, "It's uh, excelling at any job is about doing the things that you weren't asked to do." Okay, so when you're in a situation. Being excellent at the, the job, being excellent at what he's done in that situation, is actually anticipating the next situation. Like I just talked about, cognition is agency. We're always thinking about our next situation. Right? So if you really want to be, if you really want to excel in the workplace, in the future, you need to continually keep your mind on the future. What can you do to make sure that future is the best future to move into? And that's the kind of constructive intellect that people are going to want to hire. This is what she's saying. Okay. And so far, this is something that we can do as human beings that we haven't been able to figure out how to make what artificial intelligence do for us. And so at least for now, predicting the future and accommodating the future is leading, lead, being leaders, 
Yes, it's something that we're still doing. Now, if you remember back to the beginning of the presentation, Steve Wozniak thinks that's not going to be, because I'm not for long. Uh, pretty soon we're going to be pets, and the AI is going to be making our futures for us, right? Okay, here's some stuff to talk about there. Okay, here's some different kind of work types. And basically what we've got here are producers. This is the sort of lowest level of agency. This is doing this job. Um, improvers, making things a little more efficient. Some AIs are, are getting into this uh, area. At least they're assisting human beings in, in doing this kind of optimization. Uh, direct builders are designing things and making buildings and cities. And thinkers have the big ideas. That's what I'm supposed to be. As you can tell, I'm going to be a machine to replace me in a heartbeat because I'm really bad at that job. But you can see, anyways, you can see that typically what, what people will do if they want to protect themselves from, from a robot replacing their jobs is they're going to try to put themselves up here. They're going to run and they're going to, they're going to try to get away from the encroaching intelligence of the machines. Uh, okay, more stuff about coloring ambiguity, thinking contextually, the connective tissue is the killer app of today's workplaces. I love this. I, want, I, I just I like this expression, right? Um, you have to think contextually, what I call connective tissue that occupies the space in between ideas is, it is the killer app of today's workplaces. Do you understand that? Not really. I didn't really understand it either, but it sounded really cool. Okay. Now, how can we learn to do that? How can we learn to have that kind of a mindset? How can we learn uh, to, to have that connective tissue right up in, up in here? Well, um, we can learn this way, right? So when you're raising your kid, what you do, you don't praise your child for being smart. You praise your child for trying hard, and you encourage them to try to take control of the situation. Try to take control of their immediate situation so they can change it to suit themselves. Try to take, the future, try to take control of the future situations so they can change those future situations to, to suit themselves, right? And this is, how, this is how then you raise your child to, to have this kind of a mind. What they're calling here the growth mindset. It turns out that if you raise your child and you praise that child for being smart, they end up being very rigid, unable to, to anticipate changes in the environment. How many people here were raised in a family where your parents always told you you were really smart? Anyway? How many people were raised in a family where your parents always said, good job for you, you tried hard? Anyway? You, you, you did, really? You, oh, that's, that's awesome. So that explains the, the, the obvious genius. Um, I, was, I, was an op I was in an opposite situation. My dad always said, you're such a dumbass, you ruined my life. <laughs> and that, that's a certain form of motivation, I think. So. And, 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 uh, that's a growth mindset. But, but this is what we want to do. We want to change, we want to change our emphasis. You know, what do we value ourselves for? Test taking a test. Getting a high score on a test, is that, what we're, is that what we're really good for? Or is it something else? Right. Being that connective tissue, that killer app of the workspace, putting things together and creating these new futures. This is really what we want to think about. It's really about control. And this is what this is what it was for the Levites too. This is why the Levites resort to violence, because they have no control over their situation. Right? They, they have no capacity to, to exercise their agency to make their futures better for themselves. And they have no idea about how to do it. So what they do, when people run out of ideas, they resort to violence, they resort to violence and the resistance. Right. So we understand now just a little bit about how individually we might accommodate the changes in the workspace. You know, change the way we think about ourselves, change what we value about ourselves, try to maximize our robustness, anticipate the future, have some more ideas, develop some new, some new skills, get more well-rounded. This is this is what it's about, and being a general intelligence, right? And as a matter of policy. And the idea here was that they, they, you know, they resort to, they, the, the Levites resort to violence because they don't have any ideas. And lucky for us, the robots don't do that quite yet. So this is just another kind of Luddite. Anyways, um, the idea here is that, um, oh, some more stuff. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, the idea here is that um, it's, a, it's a policy. You know, how do we prepare the society? How do we prepare the next generation of people? Because this is not going to stop. How do we do that? And I'm a Socratic philosopher, so I'm back to education, right? We change the way we educate children, we get away from teaching to the test, and we begin to reinforce then this robustness.
intelligence, right? And we grow these people to anticipate and control the futures that they're going to come into. So they feel they have more power, they feel less frustrated, they have more of a growth mindset, and then you see less violence in these transitions as intelligent machines will change the world. So we both have an individual advice for yourself going forward. How do you prepare yourself for the obvious changes that are going to take place in your lifetime? But also at a policy scale, how do we then advise people in education or people in politics? How will we vote to change the way things are done in our societies? And this would be one way to train the next generation of children to accommodate these sorts of changes without violence, without so much suffering. I mean, those Luddites, they don't want to kill people, I think, if they might, right? Probably not, but they did from desperation, right? You know, we don't want to raise a generation of children who are desperate for some sense of security. The one way we can, we can avoid that problem is by training them uh, to take control of, of their own futures. So keep calling that be the change. I think that's where I stop. And I've got some anti-violence stuff. That basically means redirect your resources away from building bombs and towards doing more constructive things. Non disruptive tech innovation. I've got my own, this is a couple of them. I got the Equus model, and I've got my simulations work and stuff like that. And <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much for listening to my quite a bit of Is, is, is every human being capable of a kind of robust or general intelligence that, that then can prepare and adapt to a changing work environment? That kind of, I think absolutely yes. I think yeah. I mean, some people, maybe like me, are born with some kind of deficiency. I mean, I'm an idiot. But, but most people, I think 99.9% of people can, can do that with, with the right kind of upbringing, the right kind of, the right kind of attitude, right? I mean, I suppose if someone's born with no arms or something, they have extra trouble. Um, but yeah, in general speaking, I think so, of course. As you see the example, like a fast talk, mayor try to they try to replace their um, employees into robots. Mm -hmm. uh, you said uh, self uh, suicide proof robots. Mm -hmm. but yeah. That means that the three uh, three hundred thousand people who lose their jobs, but how can you deal with that kind of problems? Well, this is kind of a transition. I mean, it's a very large-scale transition. I mean, this is this is this terrible leadership, is what it is. I mean, um, those people are, are really in a bad position right? because I think they don't have a lot of other options. So a lot, a lot of those people are going to end up very desperate, and we may see violence because of that. And in my in my opinion, that's just bad social engineering. I mean, the people who are implementing these changes should have a plan for those people, not just throw them away or, or ignore them. When you do that kind of thing and you, and you don't listen to somebody when they're telling you they're suffering, they become desperate and then they can resort to violence. Now, in that case, who do we blame for the violence? Do we blame the desperate people that don't have options? Or do we blame the, the rich asshole who bought all the robots? I mean, most people are going to blame the, these poor people because they resorted to violence as if they really did something wrong. I, I don't, actually. I, I think that the, the moral obligation belongs to people who have the options. The people who have the options have the power, they have the access to resources, they have the ability to replace workers with robots. These people should be the leaders of the world, but they should have a plan for what the people can do. Maybe help them to re-educate, right? That kind of thing. Find them other things to do that they feel good about. Okay, some sort of living wage that gets them by, that you treat them with some dignity so they don't feel insulted and hurt every morning they wake up without anything to do. Has anyone here ever lost a job? Because you're kind of young. I mean, I've spent a good deal of my life losing jobs. And things. I've opened up feeling like a worthless piece of shit a lot. And it's not a good place to be. It's not. 
Um, and so you, you, I guess you may get to feel that to have some empathy for people in that situation. And to me, it's a question of bad leadership. So that problem is probably too far gone. Future problems we can do better with. I think that's true. Yeah. Thank you for this lecture. And then my name is Hugh Sang Yo. Uh, I have some another opinion about the future, uh, future society. The purpose we develop a machine or robot is to make our life more convenient. Mm -hmm. So why don't we make the robot, uh, robot as an artificial slave and human just spend their production and make and if we make new distribution di new distribution system, if robot production robot products the material and human just spend it easily, then don't be happy. then we don't need to work, don't need to study, don't need to well, that sounds awesome, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want my girlfriend like that? <laughs> um, yeah, no, um, there's a few problems with that. I mean, one of them is, you know, is just a problem with value. So if I work to do something and produce something, then I value that. I think it's worthwhile. I don't waste it. Right? I don't abuse it. I don't misuse it. I, do that, right? I mean, if you have some robot slaves doing everything for you, a couple generations from now, what are, what are kids going to value? What's going to be important to them, really? You know, we're just going to have a bunch of selfish, lazy... I mean, it's not going to make people better. We're not going to have any better people because we've got robot slaves. So, I mean, again, I, like I'm a Socratic philosopher, you know, my mission in life is really virtue, it's practical wisdom. It's self-understanding, it's self-knowledge. I mean, it's finding the truth, that kind of thing. So this is a hard-won, lifelong project. But if I had slaves and I had robot girlfriends and stuff like that, I'd, maybe I'd just give it up. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of hard work and you know, you got to read too much and that kind of stuff. So you know, I would be so much better if I just had some slaves. Now another problem with that is that um, you know, who has the slaves? Right? I mean, you're operating under the assumption that everybody's going to have equal access to these robot slaves. Probably not. Right? You remember, 85 people on this planet control as much wealth as 50% of the rest of the people. So I don't see that 50% of the rest of people have access to robot slaves. I see those 85 people having most of the robot slaves and these people just being forgotten about. So you give a new distribution system? A new distribution system? More people can have their own slaves. Yeah, so what we want to do is decentralize like the last guy was talking about, or remove the power from the top and make it more bottom up, and this kind of a, this is going to be easy to, to talk about. We're going to go talk to those 85 people and just give them give all their money back. No, yeah, they're rational. They'll do that. They have to be hard. Usually, usually that kind of that kind of social change requires violence. I mean, you remember the French Revolution? Guillotines and stuff. I mean, I'm looking forward to the guillotine coming back. I mean, believe me, I mean, I'm, I'm a social justice advocate. I think there needs to be a redistribution of wealth. Uh, but the sad thing is that that usually comes at the end of violence. So at the same time, you want to avoid violent revolution, you have to find more constructive solutions to that problem. So I'm with you. I would love to see that happen. But how do we get from A to B? That becomes a problem. So in my own in my own work, I've kind of focused on um, large scale psychologically ballistic simulations, which provides kind of a graphic a graphical platform. It's um, so open, and people can see then the institutions that they live in. They can see the, the ways to the use of resources keep those institutions tied together. And then they can start to play with reshaping those institutions into the world they'd like to live in, right? So a more just world with more equal distribution and stuff like that. And so in the sort of a simulation platform, it'd be accessible to most people. You don't have to be a scientist to be able to use it. You just look at it, right? You see, see a few numbers, you know, how, how things are getting distributed. And then, then you can see in the simulation what steps you have to take to get there with violence, without violence. And so as an open platform, this would be like a for open democracy, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm also working on that kind of thing, but how do we get from, from where we are to, to where you want to be? That's, that's hard, that's a tough problem. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys really, in the front, you guys really like me, huh? I must, I must smell good today. <laughs> Back there, you guys can care less. You said you love them all. It's a fair amount, it's actually. I think at this point, Okay. Actually, a few seconds ago, I don't have any kind of question, and 
First of all, my name is Kang Kyung Chun, and I'm from the thank you, Chunan National University, which was the name of the university. And just a few seconds ago, I don't have any kind of question, and he raised like a robot, robot slave. I thought I just instantly thought about thought about the Roman Empire. The reason why Roman Empire collapsed, it is not it is not about an economic weakness, it is not about the military weakness, it is about that they are spineless. After all, they had a conquered and large, they conquered many land and expanded their territory very large and they had a slave, like a unlimited and then what happens now, what happens then, it's like a, they didn't have a spy to fight themselves and defend themselves or any kind of defense forces, they were spineless when they, when they raided the battle force, they just to run away from the battlefield because they just, they just uh, all the scared of and they just, they just uh, hired a mercenary and that wasn't work but what if this way is uh, we can call this as a evolve and evolution but uh, how what if is this uh, we become the uh, incompetence about the real life and uh, incompetence about the real stuff involved to our life so I think I understand what you're saying. I think what you're saying is, is that something like this, right? So Rome collapsed because the people became less robust, right? So the citizens became less power, less strong, less less robust, and so they they depend on the slaves to do everything, so that people could do less. They become worse people, and and they're so used to getting everything easy, they didn't want to fight the thing they got, and the slaves didn't want to do it, so they just ran away. So Rome collapsed like that. Is that that's kind of your thesis there? Is that right? Um, and so you see that being a problem also for us going forward. If we had robot slaves, we'd become worse people like that too. Sure. I mean, the, the thing is, is that when we start saving labor, when we stop doing stuff, uh, we don't become you know, better cognitive agents. We become worse. So by definition up there, basically about intelligence, intelligence is really what you can do. And when you stop doing things, it's the rely on your machines to do it all, we become less smart. So people typically think that smart machines make us smarter. I think that's not true. I think the smart machines and automation make us dumber, and weaker, and less robust, and less smart, less able to work, more dependent. Right? And this does make our social systems more rigid. We become less tolerant and we, we, we can't change situations because we've never been in it. Yeah, I said that same sound. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> it's almost a dream. Yeah. yeah, so no, I mean, and so I, I'm, some people maybe think I'm kind of luddite because I am often, um, I'm often not, come on, I'm going to talk about this on the panel. I'm often not optimistic about technology. But what I think it's to do with technology, I mean, I see, I see great promise in, in, in certain directions, in certain applications of technology. So it's the way in, to what ends. Technologies are being developed. That's what I'm really suspicious about. And again, that becomes a question of evolution. You know, technologies are being developed to serve the interests of those 85 people who own everything, and, uh, and, and at the expense of everybody else. Um, anyways, so I'll let it go. That I think we're out, we're out of time. I'm not sure if I respond to your question. We'll talk more if you want to after the, after the talk. Uh, we're, out, we're out of time. No more time. Due to time constraints, we will fail the remaining question so we break our lunch time. So, before we end this session, we would like to deliver the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Wright.